effects. Uh, yeah. And so last time I talked at length about Mahayana Sutras and the problem they create and how we can understand how suddenly these texts appear basically at the turn of the millennium in India. And this is uh, basically what we are talking about. So uh, we are on chapter five and chapter five uh, talks about sickness. And that's a really intriguing topic because Vimalakirti is sick. And so uh, Manjushri is sent by the Buddha to go to inquire after his health. And so the dialogue uh, moves to a dialogue between Manjushri and Vimalakirti. So the question is why Vimalakirti is sick, right? And on page 43, Vimalakirti replies, Manjushri, my sickness comes from ignorance and the thirst of existence, and it will last as long as do the sickness of all living beings. Where all living beings to be free from sickness, I would also not be sick. Why Manjushri for the Bodhisattva? The world consists only of living beings and sickness in, inherent in living in the world. So this is a really interesting question. Why is Vimalakirti sick, right? And the sickness here is the sickness of ignorance, right? As it says, sickness come from ignorance and the thirst for existence and it last as long as the sickness of all living beings. So how are we to understand that? Were all living beings free from sickness, I would also not be sick. So on the one level, it looks like Vimla uh, Kitty is sick because all sentient beings are still, have still not attained Buddhahood, right? Is that how we understand that? Manjushri, my sickness comes from ignorance and the search for existence, it will last as long as do the sickness of all living beings. And so Vimalakirti seemed to be saying that he will be sick as long as there are sentient beings, right? Right. So doesn't this contradict the teaching that we should be trying to get to Buddhahood as quickly as possible. <laughs> Contradiction isn't a problem. Contradiction is not a problem. So what is a problem? <laughs> no, it's really interesting because in some of the Mayana texts, they talk about reaching enlightenment for the sake of all sentient beings, which is what the bodhicitta is uh, about, right? And the bodhicitta is marked, is uh, what makes a person a bodhisattva, right? So on one hand, the... On one hand, uh, it looks like uh, people are urged to become Buddha. And on the other hand, if you read this uh, text, it looks like uh, this text seems to be saying that as long as not all sentient beings have reached enlightenment, Vimalakirti will be sick, right? All right. So what do you think is going on here? Uh, 
I'm not sure I see, oh. Let's... No, go ahead, Pat. I'm not sure I see the contradiction. He says at the end of that passage, the sicknesses of the bodhisattvas arise from great compassion. Yes. And he's identifying, he's analogizing himself to the parent of a sick child. Yep. And so that, so I don't really see a contradiction. I there. see. We're all living being to be, sorry, my sickness come from ignorance and the thirst for existence that will last as long as the sickness of all living beings. Right? Yeah. So, if you read that, it looks like Vimla Kirti will not reach enlightenment until all sentient beings have reached enlightenment, right? Right. But it's also That's a contradiction. Do you see the contradiction? It seems like a contradiction, but on the on page 42, you know, when Manjushri is, is sort of talking about all the qualities of Vimla Kirti, he says you know, that he has attained the supreme excellence of the indivisible non-dual sphere of the ultimate realm. So yes. on one hand, Manjushri is saying that he is a bodhisattva, he has all these amazing qualities. Yeah. So maybe conventionally, as Pat said, you know, out of great compassion. I'm just looking at the text. Yeah. Yeah, he's a bodhisattva, but bodhisattva is sick, right? So maybe what Pat said conventionally, he's just appearing to have the kind of sickness that wants to help all sentient beings because they're sick like a parent, but he's not really sick. He's not really sick. <laughs> so it's all for sure, right? What you could say is that it's almost like confusing the path with the results. This is the level of determination that you need to actually reach enlightenment. Okay. So this is this is almost like um, I don't know, reading about the vows that um, uh, Amitabha Buddha made before he achieved enlightenment. Uh huh. Yeah. So this it's almost like you have to be so determined to do this. Uh, okay. For the person other's sake, you know, to make that achievement. Okay, so, okay, that's an interesting suggestion. Somebody else, yeah? I think, um, sorry. I th oh, I'm sorry. Um, am I cutting into somebody's talking? Um, I, I, I think that um, as a bodhisattva, um, Vimala Koti, uh, Venerable uh, Vimala Koti um, sees the suffering of all sentient beings and it pains him to see that. And, as and it's what? It pains him. It caused him to also suffer. Okay. Uh, yeah. Okay. When he sees the pain in sentient beings and uh, he... Uh, no, that's okay, but the sentence I'm trying to explain is that I will, and it will, the sickness meaning, will last as long as the sickness of all sentient beings. I, that's what I'm trying to explain. So the preceding intervenance is, is basically as a kind of uh, mind training, right? That you have ready to do that, but that's not really, really what is going to happen, right? Yeah. I'm, I'm not able to answer your question, but I'm thinking in terms of literary structure, this passage comes right before a long discussion of emptiness, yeah. a dialogue about emptiness. And so I don't, I haven't, I don't have the solution, but it strikes me that this problem might have something to do with what they're about to discuss, the prob the, the question of emptiness. Uh, I'm not sure how that works exactly. <laughs> yeah, I don't know what it would work because the question is very simple. Is, is the bodhisattva 
the person who seeks to attain full enlightenment for helping others, or is the Bodhisattva somebody who uh, postpone enlightenment until all sentient beings are enlightened, right? That's, that's, a con that's what seemed to be the contradiction, right? And uh, Nick was suggesting that, yeah, we shouldn't take this passage literally. Basically, this is, the Bodhisattva needs to be ready to do that, but actually doesn't need to do that, or is, it's not what is going to happen, right? Right, Nick? Or you could say that whether or not they reach enlightenment is almost irrelevant in the face of their determination. Okay. Yeah, but uh, then you realize that this would contradict the, the vows of bodhicitta to reach enlightenment as quickly as possible, right? But the, you've abandoned the kind of interest in self that might drive you to uh, abandon everyone else for quote unquote enlightenment. Well, actually, okay. Uh, if you look at text on bodhicitta, uh, it always talks about the fact that bodhicitta has two, uh, <coughs> is a resolution endowed with two uh, characteristic or two resolution. One is resolution for others, what you're talking about, but there is also a resolution for oneself, which is the resolution to attain the Dharmakaya, right? The resolution to attain, uh, to help others is a resolution to obtain the Rupakaya, the form body which helps, which allows the Buddha to help spontaneously all sentient beings, right? Well, wouldn't you say in that situation that, that the, the element of achieving enlightenment for yourself is not the same as a selfish interest? Oh, absolutely. So it's, it's kind of like, it, it's, I don't know, it's kind of hard to talk about because you're accomplishing your aims by almost abandoning your aims. Okay. So it's not really the same thing as saying I'm in, I'm doing it for myself. No, it's not the same thing. Uh, you you're absolutely right. But it 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 is the case that it's a kind of uh, attitude that the bodhisattva developed, which does not necessarily, at least if we take the 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 standard explanation of bodhicitta, does not reflect what is going to happen to the, the, uh, to the said bodhisattva, right? Now, I uh, want to emphasize that this is a text, right? And that text doesn't need to be in agreement exactly with the other text. And so it's quite possible that uh, this text has a different interpretation of Mahayana. So I'm just opening the possibility, but I am not deciding. As I told you last time, it's infinitely more difficult to read a text like this than to read a text like Nagarjuna, because with a text like this, uh, logic uh, helps, but goes only so far, right? Where a text like Nagarjuna, you can push the argument and you can see whether they're good argument, bad argument, how they work, and so on, but here it's a little bit different. And so this is a text which is uh, really interesting. Okay, so on page 44, uh, hear what I read, Port, page 44, middle of the page. Manjushri, you asked me why I am without servants. So this is Vimalakirti, right? Vimalakirti is asked by Manjushri, why are you in this house all alone, right? Why, uh, why am I without servant? But all Maras and opponents are my servants. Why? The Mara advocates this life of birth and death and this Bodhisattva does not avoid life. The heterodox opponent advocate conviction and the Bodhisattva is not troubled by convictions. I guess it means views. 
Therefore, all Maras and opponents are my servants. <laughs> it's kind of funny. What do you make of that? Why are all the Maras and opponents uh, his servants? Because they are all empty. Uh, how would that work? Well, it doesn't work. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's something specific to the Bodhisattva right here. This is a text for Bodhisattva. This is not a text, just on emptiness, right? Well, isn't emptiness magic? No, maybe, but uh, that doesn't explain why Vimalakirti thinks that seems to think that all Maras and opponent are my servants. What does he mean by that? How about if um, maybe he meant that uh, Maras and opponents um, are his mental afflictions? And in a way, I don't think that's what he means. No. Oh, but go, keep going. But why and, his mental affliction is his servants? Uh, and maybe servants are those that he could have control over, and they serve him. So how do they serve him? Um they can make him feel happy uh if you know they part of the the uh, the um the three poisons yeah and it's, it's the three poisons so how how comes uh and the and three poisonized servants i don't know if the maras and the opponents had to, a symbol of the poison, but they all go together, right? It's the idea is that the Maras, the poisons, are all the servants of Vimalakirti, right? Uh, so could you say that when it says here the Maras adv advocate this life of birth and death, yes. I think the Mara Maras advocate samsara, but Bodhisattvas yes. want to dwell in samsara. That's how they help people. And so he's okay. not afraid of the Maras. So why do Bodhisattva want to dwell in samsara? You're right. Because that's where all of us sick people are. What's that? Because this is where all of us who are sick so you think that this text says that Vimalakirti wants to postpone enlightenment to help sentient beings? I I don't think he wants to. I think he is enlightened from what I can tell. He's, you know, it's that non-abiding nirvana of bodhisattvas that they uh, want to be. Non-abiding nirvana is, uh, is a Buddha, right? It's not a bodhisattva. Let's, he, let's get this yes. clear. Yes. At least doctrinally. Yes. So if he's a Buddha, he's not in samsara. But, you know, it's like Shakyamuni Buddha was in samsara just to help people. No, Shakyamuni Buddha was, well, you mean when he was a Bodhisattva or when he was no, a Buddha? When he was a Buddha. Shakyamuni, as a Buddha, you're not in samsara, right? You appear in samsara, right, but you're not. Here. Yes, that's what oh, I meant. So for yeah. you, you have heard, so for you, it's all a show, right? Yeah. There is nothing going on here. Well, I feel like Vimalakirti is saying that he's not afraid of the Maras uh, tempting him to be in samsara because he's willing to be in samsara to help everyone. And he's but if not he's a Buddha, he's not in samsara by definition. Right? Appearing, appearing. Yeah, appearing is a, is. <laughs> it's a show, right? Yes. 
So nothing is going on here, right? And then I mean, the, you know, it just shows, right? <laughs> here is, uh, if you look a little bit further, the last paragraph, Vimalakiti say, uh, so householder, Manjushri asked him, how, to, how should the Bodhisattva console another Bodhisattva who is sick? He should tell him that the body is impermanent, but should not exhort him to renunciation or disgust. He should tell him that the body is miserable, but should not encourage him to find solace in liberation. How do you read that? seems like he's saying that you sh what what you almost in essence that the bodhisattva position is you don't want to go so far that you're abandoning beings yeah w why not well wouldn't that tie into why why he's saying that um, the Maras and the opponents are his servants because they yes, serve as it, objects of his compassion. Down. It all ties down there, right? It all ties down there because I think what the text is saying is that the Bodhisattva use uh, Maras defilements to reach full enlightenment, right? Isn't part of the uh, Bodhisattva path transforming the Maras? Yeah, but it's also, I and I think what the text is probably saying is that if the Bodhisattva wanted it, the Bodhisattva could pass into Nirvana almost instantly, right? Because he has the required qualities, but the Bodhisattva choose to stay in samsara in order to cultivate all the qualities that are required for full enlightenment. Because for full enlightenment, you don't need just the qualities of wisdom, you also need all the qualities that create the rupakaya, the ability of the Buddha to teach in men in all the appropriate form, right? And so what he's saying is that I don't think Vimalakirti here in the text, who knows the reality, but this is literature, right? Uh, I don't know. I don't think that Vimalakirti is presented in the text as a fully enlightened person. He is presented as, a, at least so far, as the Bodhisattva who is postponing his enlightenment to help all sentient beings. Now, Nick uh, talked about how this is in a way to what we read before was kind of like the prayer of the Bodhisattva, that the Bodhisattva will wait for enlightenment until all sentient beings are saved. So maybe this is one reading. The other reading is that, no, this is just a prayer. What the Bodhisattva does is stays in samsara as long as he has not acquired all the other qualities that are needed to attain full enlightenment. And that's what the Maras and the opponents and the poisons and impermanence and sickness are all his friends, right? Because the, some, the Bodhisattva could pass into Nirvana. He has the required wisdom 
but he chose to stay in samsara in order to cultivate all the required qualities, right? Such as patience, generosity, and so on, right? Energy and all the paramitas that are required to become fully enlightened, right? So you're saying that he um, still has the uh, subtle obstructions to uh, full enlightenment, and that's how the uh, Maras and opponents serve him, is to allow him to remain with those obstructions so that he is not fully enlightened. Is that it? Uh, yeah, maybe. I, I don't know what the text thinks that what the text assumes that his obstructions still are. Uh, maybe you're talking about subtle obstruction. The text is not talking about that, right? Yeah. yeah. And so I think it's important to try to take the text on its own merit, yeah. just uh, and not to read too much. So I don't know. Uh, Sometimes uh, some texts talk about how the Bodhisattva used the, the kleshas in order to remain in samsara to help sentient beings. And the idea why does he help sen or she help sentient beings is because the Bodhisattva is bent on cultivating all the required qualities that are necessary for full enlightenment, right? And this re uh, quality requires uh, qualities such as patience, uh, energy, giving, and so on, right? And that's all where you have all the, for, for example, forgiving, that's where you have all the Jatakas talking about the past lives of the Buddha when the Buddha was a Bodhisattva, right? Okay, so we understand what the Bodhisattva should be doing, meaning remain in samsara, right? And the question, what allows him to do that, right? And that's, I suggest, in the, the, the opposite page, on page 45, where it says, what is elimination of the sickness? It is the elimination of egoism and possessiveness. What is the elimination of egoism and possessiveness? Possessiveness, it is freedom from dualism. What is freedom from dualism? It is the absence of involvement with either the external or the internal. What is the absence of involvement with either internal or external or internal? It is non-deviation, non-flirtation, non-distraction from equanimity. What is equanimity? It is the equality of everything from self to liberation. Why? Because both self and liberation are void. How can both be void as verbal designation, they both are void and neither is established in reality. Therefore, one who sees such equality makes no difference between sickness and voidness. His, void, his sickness is voidness itself and that voidness and that sickness is, and that sickness as voidness is itself void. So, that's what allows the bodhisattva to bear to remain in samsara, right? Is this view of non-duality, right? And that's what, so it's important to understand that for this sutra, this, the view of emptiness is understood as a way in which the, the wisdom that allowed the bodhisattva to bear to remain in samsara, right? And that's what allows him to remain in samsara and yet not be prisoner of samsara and thereby uh, develop all the great qualities that are required for full enlightenment, right? And that's what I think this text is suggesting. 
So equality, uh, uh, voidness, uh, emptiness, allows him to see the equality of samsara and nirvana, right? And it is by seeing the equality of samsara and nirvana that the bodhisattva is able to bear to remain in samsara. Because if the bodhisattva did not have this uh, wisdom of emptiness, the bodhisattva would might fall prisoner to samsara, right? And so that's why the body needs the wisdom that sees samsara and nirvana as equally empty, right? As you can see, this is <laughs> pretty tough. This is not an easy teaching. This is not, uh, this is pretty tough stuff. Uh, this is, yeah, this is what I was saying the other time, that uh, these Mahayana Sutras are much more difficult to, not only just to understand, but also to practice, because they are really talking about a really difficult path, right? Because it's already hard enough to understand emptiness, and now we have to understand the equality of emptiness of samsara and nirvana, right? And this can happen only if people have enough compassion to understand that they should not go into nirvana, they should resist the temptation to go into nirvana because they have to develop the qualities that are going to help all sentient beings, right? Okay, any question about that? That's, uh, I think, the key teaching of the Vimalakirti Sutra, right? It's this idea of the equality of samsara and nirvana. I have a question, please. Yes, who is speaking? Me? Okay. Uh, uh, in terms... Oh. Yeah, in we terms, go in. Yeah, in terms of ultimate truth, you know, emptiness, uh, samsara and nirvana are the same. Yes. In terms of conventionality, conventionally, they are not the same. No, they are not the same. If they are, if conventionally they are the same, then there wouldn't be need to be for us to seek liberation or yes. enlightenment. So, so, so whenever I hear about you know, everything being the same. Yeah. I, uh, I, don't know, I don't know what to think of it. They are ultimately the same, right? But what is the key to understand here is that, okay, samsara and nirvana are empty, right? So they are the same. But here, what is important to understand is why this is so important. This is so important because the Bodhisattva has compassion and great compassion and wants to help others, right? And so he, she understands emptiness and that helps the Bodhisattva to bear the suffering of remaining in samsara, right? Because if you really understand samsara, you want to get out of it as quickly as possible, right? And so the bodhisattva can get out as quickly as possible. He has a quality required to get out of it as quickly as possible. And so what <laughs> motivates him to stay is compassion and what allows him the tool that allows him to stay is the view of emptiness right and so the view of emptiness is a tool that allows the bodhisattva to bear to remain in samsara because the bodhisattva understand that samsara really sucks and so 
there is always a temptation of saying, okay, I'm, I'm out of here, goodbye. And so the Bodhisattva has to resist that. And what motivates to him to resist is great compassion. And what's the tool that allows him to resist is the view of emptiness, right? Because he sees samsara and nirvana as being illusion-like, right? Now, it doesn't deny that it sucks to be in samsara, right? That's what the Bodhisattva needs to, the tool to see through samsara, right? <coughs> and through nirvana, sorry. I, I remember in the previous class, you reminded us that we do not have two reality. We have one reality and emptiness is really the antidote. Yes. Yeah. So, exactly. But there's oftentimes a great emphasis in emphasizing, like in this case, samsara and nirvana uh, is the same, or there's this expression that uh, ultimately, I mean, everything is in one, is, one taste. Is, yeah, equal. So what's the importance of that uniformity, that, that sameness? It's not, it's not the same, but it, I mean, it, 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 they are not the same conventionally, right? The yes, same yeah, that's, that's is, my point. Yeah, experientially they are not the same. It's just That's that right. we know that that experience, that experience is not inherently a system. That's right. They are not the same, but ultimately they are the same, right? And that's what allows the bodhisattva not to cling to nirvana, right? Okay. Because what the the obstacle of the bodhisattva is the wish to attain nirvana, right? Because if he gave into this wish to attain nirvana, he becomes an arhat, right? And so what the bodhisattva has to do, according to this text, is to avoid clinging to nirvana and therefore what he needs is to see this equality, this same ultimate sameness of nirvana and samsara, right? They are both illusions, like, right? Okay. And so it's important to bring together wisdom and compassion, right? Because the Arhat has wisdom, but he's not motivated by compassion, right? Or he's not as motivated by compassion as a Bodhisattva. On page uh, 46, in the middle of the page, it talks about the great compassion that strives to eliminate the, the passions does not conceive on any life in living being. Why? Because great compassion that fall into sentimentally, sentimentally uh, purposive view only exhausts the Bodhisattva in his reincarnation. But the great compassion, which is free <coughs> of involvement with sentimentally purposive view, does not exhaust the Bodhisattva in all his reincarnation. It does not reincarnate for involvement with such a view, but reincarnate with his mind free from involvement. If, hence, even its reincarnation is like a liberation. So the motivation is great compassion. And the tool to carry on that is the wisdom realizing emptiness, right? And that's what allows the bodhisattva to remain in samsara without falling prisoner to samsara or the other extreme, which is the extreme of nirvana, right? So here is the middle way of the bodhisattva, which is the middle way between samsara and nirvana, right? <coughs> and that's what allows the bodhisattva to grow all the proper qualities of the bodhisattva. 
right? That's what this text seems to be saying, right? So this text is not necessarily saying that it's all a show as some other texts may suggest, right? Uh, this is not the reading that I make of this text, at least so far, right? Now, there are the text which talks about how this is all a show and so on. For example, that the Buddha was not really a bodhisattva, but was already fully enlightened and so on. Uh, this is not this kind of text, right? This kind of text is message is very clear, is the equality of samsara and nirvana. Motivation is great compassion. The way to carry on this uh, motivation is a view of emptiness that allows the bodhisattva to remain in samsara without being prisoner of samsara, right? That's what this text seems to be saying. And that's, I think, the central teaching of this uh, sutra. Any more question about that? Yep, yeah, please. Um, yeah, um, that's kind of mind blowing and wonderful. Um, <laughs> and I wanted to. Uh, just... Yeah, this is not easy stuff, right? <laughs> <laughs> I. I <laughs> Yes. I was also struck just uh, just below the passage you were reading. Yeah. Kind of amazing uh, assertion. Hence, even his reincarnation is like a liberation. Yeah, is like he a liberation. Reincarnated right? as if being liberated. Yes. In order in order to teach the Dharma. So this is this is also about. Um, uh, about teaching. It's about teaching the Dharma. Yeah, that's um, right. It's and about... also, I, what does that mean that a reincarnation, does that mean it would feel like liberation or? Uh, I think it, it means that even if he is reincarnated, uh, he still is not caught by samsara, right? It does not reify samsara, it doesn't get attached to things because he has always this view of emptiness, right? And so it is as if he was liberated, right? Yeah. That's how I read it, at least. Any more questions? It's a great text, I must say. Okay, so I let's... Question. Yeah, please. Yeah, yeah. It has to do with the line about he does not conceive of any life in living beings. Yeah, what? that's to do uh, with emptiness, right? Yeah, it just means uh, no self-existence, no self-existent life. Yeah, yeah, that's being. right. Okay. He sees all sentient beings as empty, right? Uh, okay. And, and when it being... talks about accidental passions? Uh, I think it just means passions. Uh. Because passions are uh, I think it means, I don't know what the word is in the text, but uh, they're sometimes talk as accidental because they are removable, right? Oh, okay, thank they you. They're not inherent to the mind, right? Right. Yeah. Okay, so chapter six, the inconceivable liberation. Thereupon the venerable Sharaputra has this thought, there is not even a single chair in this house. Where are those disciples and bodhisattva going to sit? <laughs> Hopefully you see the humor of this text. This is what it's, uh, it's a great piece of literature. Uh, the Likavi uh, Vimalakirti read the thought of the Venerable Shariputra and said, Reverend Shariputra, did you come here for the sake of Dharma or did you come here for the sake of chair? So this is <laughs> the same motive of making fun of the Arhat, right? Which is a typical motif of the 
the Mahayana literature, right? Which is also uh, uh, a literature which is engaged in argument against uh, people who deny the Mahayana, right? In India, uh, we have we had the Buddha, we have basic Buddhism, and then on top of basic Buddhism arise these traditions. Mahayana, which is found in the Mahayana Sutra of texts claiming to be from the Buddha and presenting a different teaching uh, from that of the basic uh, canonical text, right? And so in India, uh, there was intense controversy of whether the Mahayana was, was really Buddha's teaching. And so uh, these texts obviously are part of that controversy and they are heavy on rhetoric. And part of the rhetoric here is to make fun of the arhat, right? You probably realize it's kind of slightly ridiculous. Shariputra is an arhat. He doesn't care whether there is a chair or not right? It's all literature, right? But it's a kind of good literature. It's kind of fun. And uh, uh, it served the purpose of uh, uh, polemicking against those who uh, do not want to accept the Mahayana. As you know, in India, uh, the majority of, of uh, Buddhists, probably up to quite late, was probably not that interested in Mahayana. Mahayanists were probably a minority of people and monks and lay people who lived uh, side by side with basic Buddhists in basically in good, uh, in good intelligence. But there were these texts which seemed to be uh, part of uh, who are polemical in tone, right? And this making fun of Yahat is part of this polemic. Okay, so let's go to page 52. So this is the inconceivable liber liberation, right? So uh, second paragraph, when those bodhisattva who attain super knowledge transform their bodies to a height of 40, 200,000 leagues and sat upon the throne, but the beginner bodhisattva were not able to transform themselves <coughs> to sit upon, sit upon the throne. Then the Lichavi, the Varakirti, taught these beginners bodhisattva, a teaching that enabled them to attain the five super knowledge, and having attained them, they transformed their body to a height of 40 to 100,000 leagues and sat upon the throne. But still, the great disciples were not able to seat themselves upon the throne. The Lichavi Vimalakirti said to the Venerable Shariputra, Reverend Shariputra, take your seat upon the throne. He replied, good sir, the throne are too big and too high, and I cannot sit upon them. Vimalakirti said, Reverend Shariputra, how down, bow down to the Tathagata Merupra, the Paraja, and he, you will be able to take your seat. When the great disciple bowed down to the Tathagata, Meru Pradip uh, Paraja, and they were seated upon the throne. And then I skip a paragraph, and then the Lichavi uh, Vimlakitu replies to Shariputra, Reverend Shariputra, for the Tathagata and the Bodhisattva, there is a liberation called inconceivable. The Bodhisattva who live in the inconceivable liberation can put the King of Mountain Sumeru, which is so high, so great, so noble, and so vast, into a mustard seed. He can perform this feat without enlarging the mustard seed and without shrinking Sumeru. So this is what is called the inconceivable liberation, right? And in a way, there is nothing to explain because it's inconceivable. So the idea is that there are all these thrown, I forgot how high they are, 
they all fit in Bimalakirti's house, despite the fact that they are way bigger than Bimalakirti's house. Bimalakirti's house is much smaller, and yet they fit completely without the throne becoming smaller and without the house becoming bigger, right? And this is, I don't understand. This is literally inconceivable, right? Or what's the purpose of showing us inconceivable things like this? But the sutra is meant for us to read. Yes, it's meant to us to read. So there are several ways, I think, to understand that. One is that <laughs> the sutra is meant to generate faith. because faith is very important in the Mahayana, in Buddhism in general, but in the Mahayana tradition in particular, right? Because faith is what uh, one should have towards the qualities of the Buddha. And that's what motivates us to practice the Mahayana, right? Which is a much more difficult path with the, much more difficult than the already extremely difficult path of basic Buddhism, right? So the ex to inc what is important is faith in the quality of the Buddhas, right? And that's strongly emphasized in the Mahayana Sutra. And so that's why Vimalakirti tells Shariputra to bow down to the Tathagata and then by bowing down and having faith in the quality of the Buddha, Shariputra can sit on the throne, right? Something he cannot do just by himself. Now, there is also uh, in some sutras, the suggestion that this is actually how reality is, right? That is, uh, this is particularly the teaching of the Avatamsaka Sutra, which is the sutra of the Huayan school of Buddhism in China, and which is, uh, has a very famous passage of, I think it's called the Tower of Vairochana, in which the Bodhisattva goes into the Tower of Vairochana and sees that uh, the Tower of Rochana, each of the atoms contains the full universe in itself. So it's the same teaching as here, that Mount Meru is contained in a mustard seed and Mount Meru is not smaller, the, man, uh, the mustard seed is not bigger. It's all, <coughs> it, it's all this kind of mutual imbrication into each other, right? And that's I guess something like what reality is really like, right? Now, maybe you can call it, I don't know, a metaphor for uh, us to understand that reality is not made of these separate entities that we reify, but is basically a set of interactions. Uh, and so that's, I think, Another way to understand this teaching of the inconceivable liberation, right? But uh, it, it is inconceivable. It feels to me that this kind of teaching is more like preaching to the choir. Uh, I, sure. I'm somebody without faith. Um, yes. Uh, uh, when I you, come across something like this, they seems fantastical and magical. Yes. Yes. And, and when the the whole, if you remember, the sutra starts in a fantastical and magical uh, atmosphere, right? I read the other the other day the beginning of the sutra and. It's not like the Buddha is surrounded by uh, a few of his disciples. The Buddha is surrounded by 
thousand and thousand of bodhisattva, bhikshu, and so on. So it's all clear that <coughs> this is not uh, a text which assumes ordinary reality. It's not a text which is based on how ordinary reality works, right? So it is fantastical, it is magical. Now, magic is all, has always been part of Buddhism, right? So this is in a way not a surprise, but it is obviously quite an extraordinary text, right? I mean, we, we are told that, uh, you know, when uh, Manjushri and all his retinue comes uh, into the house of Vimalakirti, suddenly thousands of seats appear, right? Yeah, that's not the housekeeper suddenly remain remembering that, yeah, there are a few seats in the back room and putting them out, right? It's all magical and miraculous, right? And, <laughs> and this is very much... Uh, the atmosphere of the Mahayana Sutra, right? They are not teachings given by the Buddha to ordinary people. They are visionary teachings, right? that people receive maybe in visions, in mystical visions. And so this, uh, it's not surprising, given that those are visionary texts, that, you know, they have a kind of fantastic and magical quality as mystical visions do, right? I think it makes sense, right? Well, I suppose. I told you it's I not, it's not like Madhyamika, where you can argue and so on. This is a really different kind of text. It is not just this sutra, but other sutra that I read. Oftentimes, there's, you know, passages and passages of sometimes description of the place having a lot of jewels and this and that. And yes. I go on and on. And it was like, what is this all about? You know? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, there is a, a big difference between the basic Buddhist sutra and the Mahayana sutra, right? The basic Buddhist sutra have a lot of repetition and a lot of fury and all these things, but they always seem to uh, presuppose a kind of ordinary reality in which the Buddha is a teacher and is surrounded by a few disciples who are, uh, are around them, him and listen to him and learn from him, right? And so this kind of teachings are quite different from these teachings, which are literally extraordinary, right? <laughs> this is not the Buddha was in travesty surrounded by 10 people and at that time, Ananda asked him this and this and that, and this is what the Buddha said. No, we're not talking about that. We're talking about thousands of people who, how do they fit on the Vulture Peak? I have no idea. Vulture Peak is actually pretty small, but you know, it's the same thing of thousands of uh, all the Bodhisattva and all the disciples coming to uh, Vimalakiti's house and they all fit in despite the fact that the house is not bigger and the seats are not smaller, and it's all this kind of uh, visionary, miraculous, magical text, right? Professor, um, yeah? is this similar to like the use of um, poetry in um, literature where, you're, where poetry sometimes wants to describe the indescribable. Uh, yeah, maybe, maybe. I mean, as I as I uh, said, I, I think these texts have to be taken as literary text, right? 
they teach something important, which is the path of the Bodhisattva. And that's what I talked about the uh, equality of samsara and nirvana. And that's, I think, the central teaching of the sutra. But they do it in a literary way, right? They don't offer you a reasoning. They don't offer you an argument. They are, they are literary texts, right? And so, yeah, maybe poetry is one way to understand that. Visionary text is another way <coughs> to understand. And often the two go together, right? Professor, I think Larry had, a, had, a, had his hand up for a, a while. Sure, go ahead. You have to unmute yourself. You're muted. I was wondering if this had a connection to Vajrayana or a sort of an entry or something. Uh, no, I don't think so. I mean, uh, in a way, uh, Vajrayana is, I, I think, I, I don't know if you were here last time, but Vajrayana has the advantage that it tells us forthright that this is not an ordinary teaching given by Shakyamuni Buddha to a few disciples. But this is a visionary text received by a Mahasiddha after practicing in the wilderness for years, right? Can be in Kashmir, can be in the Swat Valley, it can be in Assam. But Tantra are very openly describing the way they, uh, they uh, are received, that they're always received by a practitioner who has a vision of this Tantric deity, right? And so tantra, tantra texts, at least the uh, Anuttara Yoga Tantra, are in a way very forthright about how they present themselves, right? The problem of the Mayana Sutra is that they are not forthright. They claim to be the teaching of, the, of Shakyamuni Buddha, and yet this goes against all historical evidence, right? And so, Scholars have elaborated many scenarios. My favorite scenario is this visa visionary text, right? And the magical nature of this text, the magical atmosphere of this text reflect the visionary nature, right? So would you say that, that the, the word inconceivable it's almost like it's only inconceivable in relation to the ordinary way that we see things. Uh, yeah, uh, absolutely. It's inconceivable for us, right? But I think it, it's not sometimes uh, emptiness is described as inconceivable, right? And that's not the same. Because emptiness can be argued for, right? Can be thought about. Now, we might not get exactly to emptiness by just thinking uh, logically or not. We can, uh, this is another topic, but emptiness, we can <coughs> think about the argument and suddenly we have this understanding that things are empty, which arises, right? Here, it's literally inconceivable by us. There is no way you can think about how Vimalakirti's house is not getting bigger and the throne are not getting smaller. And yet the throne, which are, I forgot how many thousands of miles high, still fit into Vimalakirti's house, right? This is literally inconceivable for us. So I think it's important. That's what I said at the beginning of the chapter. The chapter means exactly what it said, that it is inconceivable. Not just that you might not find, be able to express fully what it is, right? Like emptiness. Maybe emptiness, you cannot give a full description because in a way, the insights that arise from thinking about uh, the reasoning uh, leading to understanding of emptiness 
uh, that insight cannot be fully captured into words, right? That's one way, that's a weak sense of inconceivable, right? It's just because language refers to think and emptiness is not a thing. And so we cannot really conceive of emptiness because emptiness is not a thing. <clears throat> but there is nothing contradictory in emptiness. It's just, it's not a thing. And that's what makes it difficult to understand. But it's in a way, <laughs> we can gain insight into emptiness, right? This is literally inconceivable, at least by me. Now, maybe you can conceive a bit, but I cannot conceive as my room, which is pretty big, uh, <laughs> could host uh, thousands of bodhisattva sitting on thrones miles high, and uh, the room would not be bigger, and the throne would not be smaller, and yet they would all fit in, right? I cannot conceive of that. Can you? But isn't there some, for the reader of this, isn't there some reaction of delight and awe? Yeah. Yes, exactly. That, that, that brings you to the Dharma. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Now, we assume that it's not just a literary effect, right? But it at least metaphorically corresponds to a view of reality that may be gained by a fully enlightened person, right? Since this is a Mahayana text, right? So it's not just for the, the sake of creating delight and generating faith, but that's certainly one important part of the text, right? Professor, okay. Snay, yes, Snay, please. Now you have a question. Yes, thank you, uh, Professor. I was just curious. You know, here it says that that the Tagatas and the and Bodhisattvas live in inconceivable liberation. Yes. I was wondering for the Bodhisattvas, like what stage Bodhisattvas live in inconceivable liberation? What what? What stage Bodhisattvas? Like, are we talking? You know, uh, I have stage? no idea because this is. This text does not talk about stages, right? Right. Yeah, so I think it's important to keep this uh, literature separate. Now we can say, well, maybe it's an Arya Bodhisattva or something like this, but I think it's, it's I would resist the temptation to use other texts to try to understand this text. I think it's better to try to understand the text by itself, right? Now, I know that's not how a Tibetan teacher would teach, but I think that's a better way to understand the text because uh, we don't know what kind of, uh, we don't know what, uh, what kind of text this, text assumes, right? It's clearly part of a tradition, but it's not necessarily exactly in tune with other texts that may be quite later, right? So, I don't know. You would say something like an Arya Bodhisattva, right? But that's not what this text is talking about, right? Okay, so I have a few more minutes and then I will, uh, yeah, okay, perfect. So what we can talk about is chapter seven, which is <laughs> a really funny chapter. <laughs> so, Mirmala uh, Kiti, and Manjushri are in, uh, engaged in talking about the great joy of the Bodhisattva, compassion, and all this other quality, also uh, emptiness. And then on page 
58, a certain goddess who lived in the house, in that house, having heard this teaching of the Dharma of the great heroic Bodhisattva and being delighted, pleased and overjoyed, manifested herself in a material body and showered the great spiritual hero, the Bodhisattva, and the great disciple with heavenly flowers. I would like that. When the flowers fell on the bodies of the bodhisattvas, they fell off the floor. But when they fell on the bodies of the great disciple, they stuck to them and did not fall. The great disciple shook the flowers and even tried to use the magical power, but still the flower would not shake off. Then the goddess said to the venerable Shariputra, Reverend Shariputra, why do you shake these flowers? Shariputra replied, Goddess, these flowers are not proper for monks, right? So we are trying to shake them off. The goddess says, do not say that, Shari, Reverend Shariputra. Why? These flowers are proper indeed. Why? Such flowers have neither constructual thought nor discrimination. But the elder Shariputra has both constructual thought and discrimination. So this is about the beginning of the chapter on the goddess, right? What do you make of that exchange? Quite funny, actually. <laughs> so, certain goddess living in that house, right? So the goddess is a bodhisattva, right? That's what that means. And she flowers, she throws all these flowers because she's delighted and the flowers stick to the arhat and does not stick to the bodhisattvas, right? So this is part of the same rhetoric of Mahayana's rhetoric of trying to assert the superiority of the Mahayana teaching, right? Because we all know that in reality, Arhat, who have realized emptiness, would the flowers would not stick to them, right? But you know. This is literature, right? And so the arhat are made fun of because they are not free of the constructual thought and discrimination, right? And what you think the discrimination is here? I think the discrimination here is a discrimination between Nirvana and Samsara, right? That's what the Arhats are not free from, right? And therefore, the flowers stick to them, right? And so you have this hilarious scene in which the Arhat, who are monks, are trying to throw away the flowers and the flower stick to them, right? And I think the idea is that this illustrates the fact that the Arhat have not reached the full potential of the view of emptiness, which is the understanding of the equality of samsara and nirvana, right? And they discriminate between samsara and nirvana. And that's why the flowers, which I assume is a symbol of samsara, right? It's pretty, it's alluring. So I assume here is samsara, right? And so these uh, flowers stick to the disciple, but they don't stick to the uh, bodhisattva, because the uh, bodhisattva understand the equality of samsara and nirvana.
So I am not going to read the whole thing, but there is the dialogue between uh, the goddess and uh, Shariputra is uh, pretty interesting on page 60. It says, a goddess says, liberation is freedom from desire, hatred, and folly. That is the teaching for the excessively proud. But those free of pride are taught that the very nature of desire and folly is itself liberation. Shariputra, excellent goddess, pray, what have you attained? What have you realized that you have such eloquence? Goddess, I have attained nothing, Reverend Shariputra. I have no realization, therefore I have, I have such eloquence. Whoever thinks I have attained, I have realized is overly proud in the dis discipline of the well-taught Dharma. Shariputra, Goddess, do you belong to the disciple vehicle, to the solitary vehicle or the great vehicle? I belong to the disciple will vehicle when I teach it to those who need it. I belong to the solitary vehicle when I teach those 12 links of dependent origination to those who need them. And since I never abandoned the great compassion, I belong to the great vehicle as all need that teaching to attain ultimate liberation, right? So it's here the same idea, right? That uh, we should, <coughs> that the view of emptiness is what allows the bodhisattva to remain in samsara, right? And therefore cultivate all the necessary qualities to enlightenment. So Shariputra and the goddess go at each other for quite a while, then on page 61, Shariputra says, Goddess, what prevents you from transforming yourself out of your female state? That's where the text is kind of interesting for its gender implication. Goddess, also, I have sought my female state for these 12 years. I have not yet found it. Reverend Shariputra, if a magician were to incarnate a woman by magic, would you ask her what prevents you from transforming yourself out of your female state? Shariputra, no, such a woman would not really exist. So what would there be to transform? Goddess, just so Reverend Shariputra, all things do not really exist. Now, would you think what prevents one whose nature is that of a magical incarnation from transforming herself out of a formal a female state. Thereupon, the goddess employed her magical power to cause the elder Shariputra to appear in her form and to cause herself to appear in his form. This the goddess transformed into Shariputra, said Shariputra, transformed into a goddess. Reverend Shariputra, what prevents you from transforming yourself out of your female state? And Shariputra transformed into the goddess reply, I no longer happy to have the form of a male. My body has changed into the body of a woman. I do not know what to transform. <laughs> I, I am not sure what to make of it. <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's tons of fun. Now, uh, it's pretty clear that it's, also about emptiness, because gender is empty, right, and therefore is illusory. But I, I, I'm not sure what are the gender implications that we should get from this transformation of one into the other. I think it's absolutely hilarious. It's great literature. What do you think the implications are? Well, it does seem to mock Sariputra, as we're getting used to. Um, yeah. It's mocking him, but there also, I mean, it does seem to me there's a feminist reading here. Um, 
that that uh, that it makes no sense to have to have to even have an idea that a woman can't be enlightened. So, and Sariputra is then suddenly uh, okay. embodied as a woman and has to sort of confront that. But that seems so unlikely that there would be this kind of, you know, feminist, I guess that's, you know, proto-feminist or however we want to put it. Um, but it, it's, it's a delightful, another delightful passage. Of, yeah, it's, it's an interesting fun and cross-dressing and you know transsexuality uh, I, it's, all, I, it's all very yummy <laughs> anybody else i don't know if it is uh about, i don't think it's about transgendering but i could be wrong I think it it takes it takes it it's a little chip in the you know in the traditional Buddhist you know wall of of uh, you know the certain certainty that men that w that in order to be enlightened the woman yeah. needs to come back be reborn as a man. Yeah, that's that's you're right. So there is that feminist or as you said proto-feminist dimension, right? I think that's quite okay to read that. I think that uh, proto, uh, professor. I think I don't know that calling it proto-feminist or feminist is the right thing. I think that kind of like narrows it because what they're saying is women, you know, as well as anything else you can think of, can be enlightened. Any sentient being. And uh, so beyond, no, it doesn't say that. It says more than that, because the goddess. Uh, it said, you know. Cats can be enlightened, but cats cannot be enlightened in the cat form, right? That's true. Yeah. 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 This saying that women can be enlightened, and it's not saying they need to be reborn as a man and so on. So I think it's not wrong to read some kind of what you would call proto feminist, uh, where I am much more doubtful, but I don't know is when you talk about gender fluidity. I don't know. It is a kind of gender fluidity, but it's kind of very peculiar gender fluidity, right? It's the emptiness of gender, and therefore women or men can be enlightened, right? Because gender is uh, empty, right? It's illusory, right? That's how I read it. Uh, now, there are discussion of gender fluidity in Buddhism, but they are found in uh, the Vinaya, right? And I have always wondered what are they exactly talking about? But there they are talking about men transforming into women and women transforming into men. So there is such thing as gender fluidity in the Vinaya, but I'm not sure that this is what the Sutra has in mind. I think the Sutra has in mind more the idea that both men and women can attain full enlightenment because gender is uh, empty, right? Is illusory, is conventional, right? And then there is obviously the rhetorical put down of the disciple, right? Who are to whom the flowers stick, right? And this is a sign that it discriminates between samsara and nirvana. Anything else? I think we have enough for today. So we'll conclude uh, next time. Next Monday. Thank you. Have a good evening. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
Bye-bye. Bye.